Good morning, everyone. It's Friday, October 1st, coming to you live from Seoul. I'm Kim Mugen. Before we begin, these are the stories we're following at the top of the hour. North Korea claims it test launched a new version of an anti-aircraft missile on Thursday. The regime says the launch proved the military efficiency of the weapon, including the quick response of the operation systems and the extension of distance for hitting its target. South Korea extends its social distancing level for another two weeks beginning Monday. More vaccine incentives are expected to be announced as the nation's vaccination rate rises steadily. And just before the major fiscal deadline, the U.S. Senate has passed a bill to keep the government funded into early December, preventing a government shutdown. Our top story this morning, North Korea has confirmed that it test launched a new version of an anti-aircraft missile. The latest launch took place just a day after the North expressed interest in restoring severed inter-Korean communication channels. However, Pyongyang has not responded to Seoul's phone calls this morning. For more, we have our Kim Dami on the line for us. Tami, give us the details. Mogan, North Korea has test fired a new type of anti aircraft missile capable of downing air targets at longer distances with enhanced accuracy. This is the second launch just this week and the seventh one this year. Pyongyang had already test launched a hypersonic missile for the first time on Tuesday. And just like Tuesday's test, leader Kim Jong un was not present at the firing. Instead, a member of the Presidium of the Politburo of the Ruling Workers' Party, Park Jong chun guided the launch. According to the North State Media on Friday, the regime's Academy of Defense Science had conducted the test the day before aimed at confirming the practicality of operation of the launcher, radar, and comprehensive battle combat performance of the missile. The anti-aircraft missile fired on Thursday is presumed to be a surface-to-air missile, a weapon system that is a defensive in nature. South Korea Joint Chief of Staff said as far as evaluating the North's report and is closely watching Pyongyang's movements. At the Supreme People's Assembly on Thursday, Kim Jong-un signaled a willingness to restore communication lines with the South as early as October. Pyongyang has been unresponsive to SARS' regular phone calls since the South Korea-U.S. joint military drills in the summer. At the same time, Kim has long pledged to continue developing weapons for the self-defense of his regime, carrying out four missile-related activities since September. Watchers point out that the North's unpredictable, whimsical moves show that the regime sees a dialogue with the South and its own military buildup for self-defense as separate matters. That's all I have. Back to you, Mogan. Thank you for the updates, Tommy. Now, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken has admitted North Korea's string of missile tests has upped tensions in the region. According to AFP Thursday, Blinken expressed concerns over North Korea's repeated violations of U.N. Security Council resolutions. As Washington assesses the type of the missile launched this week, the North American Aerospace Defense Command says the U.S. homeland would be safe even if it was a hypersonic missile, as the North claims. That was echoed by Pentagon spokesman John Kirby, who insisted the missile does not pose an immediate threat to the U.S. The U.N. Security Council has postponed a closed-door meeting to discuss the situation in North Korea by a day to Friday local time. According to AFP, the meeting was organized at the request of the U.S., Britain and France after Pyongyang claimed it tested a new hypersonic gliding missile. If confirmed, it would be a significant advance in the regime's weapons technology. But China and Russia, the Council's other permanent members, reportedly requested the postponement, saying they need more time to investigate. We now turn to the COVID-19 situation. The South Korean government has extended the current social distancing measures for an additional two weeks. The country's current measures have been in place for 12 weeks with no signs of improvement, especially with South Korea's post Chuseok holiday surge. For more on this, we have our Kim do at the News Center. do I heard there were any tweaks to some details, though. That's right, mo With the two-week extension of the current social distancing levels, comes a few changes to details that will allow people to breathe a little bit, especially those who have been fully vaccinated. Take a listen to what Prime Minister Kim bu gyum had to say earlier. We decided that current COVID-19 conditions were too severe for us to ease the virus prevention measures. 
However, we would like to help restore a bit of daily life by adjusting some of the prevention standards, including weddings, first birthday celebrations, and outdoor sports facilities, which many people are voicing pains about by focusing on those who have a complete vaccination. The Seoul area has been under the strongest level of distancing for the past three months, with only six people allowed for a social gathering, including at least two fully vaccinated people before 6 p.m. and after that, four fully vaccinated. The Prime Minister did, however, add that the country will take steps towards normalcy starting November once more people are fully vaccinated. The process will be based upon a gradual process, but at the same time, the authorities will enforce the standing rules strictly to make sure no one is letting their guard down until the end. But throughout the process, he said, government's ears will be open to everyone's voice. Now, as for the daily caseload, South Korea reported 2,486 new COVID-19 infections on Friday, of which all but 35 were locally transmitted. It's down 78 from 24 hours before, but up 56 on last Friday's figure, which followed the end of the long Chuseok holiday, indicating the post-holiday surge could yet worsen. The capital region accounted for more than three-quarters of cases. The number of infections per 100,000 people in the Seoul area stands at 9.8 almost doubled the national average of 5.1. On a positive note, however, Friday marked a milestone for the vaccination campaign with 50.1% of the nation now fully vaccinated. The country's goal at the moment is to have that number pass 70 by the end of October. And with the speed of the inoculation process at the moment, it's a target that seems to be achievable. The third phase of clinical trials for Sputnik V for people over 60 years old has finished, showing a high level of safety and efficacy. This is according to Russian Health Minister Mikhail Marashko on Thursday local time. He added, the vaccine's developer, Gamaleya Center, is now updating its recommendations for use and it's compiling a final report on the test results. Funded by the Russian Direct investment fund, this viral vector, viral vector vaccine was the first COVID-19 vaccine to be developed in the world in August last year. It was rolled out following phase two trials, prompting concerns over its safety when it first was administered to citizens. However, the Lancet backed the vaccine last February based on phase three results available at the time, easing some concerns. At the moment, more than 70, 70 countries have rolled out the vaccine to its citizens. To boost consumer spending amid the pandemic-hit economy, the South Korean government is rolling out another COVID-19 relief program. The program gives a small amount of cash back per month based on card spending and applications can be made from today. Our Om ji tells us more. Consumers in South Korea will be able to get a small amount of money back if they spend more than usual. Applications for a cashback scheme where consumers across the nation can get 10 percent cashback on their extra credit or debit card spending starts on Friday. The program that runs from October 1st to November 30th is designed to encourage consumer spending amid the pandemic. Consumers can get the 10 percent cashback on their extra card spending per month if they spend at least 3 percent more on their cards than their average monthly consumption in the second quarter of this year. A maximum of 85 U.S. dollars cashback a month can be claimed. The extra money will be given as card points that can be used like cash and will be given on the 15th of the following month. People can apply through their card companies by calling them or visiting their websites or branches in person. Anyone 19 or older in South Korea who has been using a credit or debit card from one of nine major card companies in the second quarter of this year can apply. Foreigners are also eligible. The application dates differ depending on a person's birth year. Those who were born in a year ending in one or six can apply on Friday with applications to continue from Tuesday and will be open until November 30th. The cashback scheme can be used in a variety of places and also online, including food delivery apps. However, purchases made at big supermarket chains, major department stores and big online stores will not be included in the scheme. 
The government has allocated almost 600 million U.S. dollars for this program, but if the allotted fund runs out, the program can be ended earlier than expected. Om ji Arirang News. U.S. senators have approved a bill to prevent the government shutdown, which could have resulted in furloughs of federal workers and the suspension of certain services. Kim Hyo-sun has this report. Just before the major fiscal deadline, the U.S. Senate has passed a bill to keep the government funded into early December, preventing a government shutdown. The bill passed with 65 in favor, achieving the 60-vote threshold needed. If the bill had not been enacted, the federal government would have faced a shutdown on Friday. With the latest move, both the Senate and House passed a short-term appropriations bill to keep the government running until December 3rd. And the country will be able to avoid a lapse in funding once President Joe Biden signs it into law. The Senate's resolution does not include the debt limit increase, which the Republicans had been opposed to, forcing the Democrats to approve the bill on their own. Nevertheless, it does include billions of dollars to assist in responding to two recent deadly hurricanes that battered the Gulf Coast and eastern seaboard, as well as other funds to aid the resettling of refugees arriving from Afghanistan. Meanwhile, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has called for the removal of the debt ceiling, stressing that a potential default is looming for the country in October. It is imperative that Congress address the debt limit. If not, our current estimate is the Treasury will likely exhaust its extraordinary measures by October 18th. At that point, we expect Treasury would be left with very limited resources it would be depleted quickly. America would default for the first time in history. Addressing the House Committee on Financial Services Thursday, she also added that it would be, quote, catastrophic if Congress does not raise the debt ceiling, pointing out that it needs to make decisions on taxes and spending. She warned a possible default on U.S. debt would result in job losses, economic damage, and a drop in the stock market. Kim Yosan, Arirang News. And news just in, President Joe Biden has signed the stopgap bill, which will now keep the government funded through early December, narrowly, narrowly averting a government shutdown. In other news, high-level U.S. and Russian diplomats have agreed to form two working groups on strategic issues and nuclear weapons disarmament. Sputnik News reported that the U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman had strategic talks on Thursday local time with Russian counterpart Sergei Lavrov. One of the working groups will manage principles and tasks on the armament control, while the other group will deal with the potential of, potential of strategic weapons. The Russians hosted the second round of talks in Geneva, which follows previous meeting held at the U.S. mission in the Swiss capital in July. In sports, South Korea beat the Taiwanese women's national basketball team in a nail-biting playoff game in Jordan Thursday, booking their ticket into the semifinals of the International Basketball Federation Women's Asia Cup. Shooting guard Park Hye-jin scored 16 points in the fourth quarter alone, helping South Korea win 80-74. In terms of the semis, South Korea take on China on Saturday. Japan, seeking a fifth straight title, play Australia on the same day. With its blend of a unique story, amazing writing, colorful sets, and wonderful acting, the Korean Netflix drama series Squid Game has become a massive global sensation. One of the show's non-Korean stars came to Korea from India over a decade ago to become an actor. Our Choi won Jung had the opportunity to speak to him about his pursuit of stardom in Korea and his plans for the future. People should register me as an actor not in that frame of an image. I want, I want to break that. My desire is to break that frame and go beyond. But it can happen, it cannot happen. It's a matter of time. Back in 2010, a 21-year-old Anupam Tripathi first came to South Korea to follow his dream of becoming an actor. And one of my friends told me, like, there is a scholarship in Korean National Un University of Arts if you can pass the exam, you can learn what you love the most. And that stuck in my head. I did not think like what's in India, Hollywood, or like 
anywhere around the world. Throughout his time in acting school, he was constantly faced with cultural and language barriers, but they didn't hold him back. Try at least. At least try. Let's try. It's hard. It's very hard. It's difficult. But at the same time, I always have challenged myself like, if I have come this far, let's move one more step. He's had a supporting roles in various films and also appeared in the 2021 Korean sci-fi movie Space Sweepers. Finally, after 10 years, he landed his first major role after being cast in the Netflix series Squid Game. Tripathi plays Abdul Ali, a migrant factory worker from Pakistan who desperately needs money to support his family. The script is wonderful, okay. So we, everybody who, who understands or something, there was a feeling that it will go big. But this big, that is unexpected. For me, I, I didn't expect it this big. So if I heard correctly, you mostly played the role as an immigrant in Korea. And uh, to, to prepare for your role, I heard that you actually went out and talked to other immigrants in Korea. Is that right? As an actor, you observe, you feel, and you, you try to grasp that, uh, that idea of a person, how and why he's like that, what he's desiring for. So all those things come when you talk to different kind of people. He's proud to have played an immigrant character in Korean film, but says he's ready to continue to challenge himself as an actor. So I want to do diverse character with diverse stories. At the same time, I, I hope, I hope that I can, I can pave the path for other foreign talents who existing in Korea and who want to come to Korea. That if, if I can do it, so, so do you. Choi Won Jung, Arirang News. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. We start off in the UK, where British motorists continue to struggle finding a gas station that has enough supply to fill their tanks. As the gas crisis caused by an acute shortage of truck drivers continues, motorists are seeing hours-long queues for gas. And even football star Cristiano Ronaldo has been impacted by the shortage as his personal driver was seen waiting seven hours at a gas station, only to leave empty-handed. Even with all the money he has due to his recent lucrative move to Manchester United, he's in the same boat as the rest of the country, as the Portuguese star might be housebound if the shortage continues. The Petrol Retailers Association, which accounts for about two-thirds of all the UK gas stations, said Wednesday that 27% of its members reported being out of fuel but expects the situation to improve in the next 24 hours. The chaotic week saw fights break out at gas stations, as British ministers have repeatedly said the crisis is easing, despite ordering soldiers to start driving fuel trucks. Over to Ecuador, where a deadly prison riot which began Tuesday night saw its death toll rise further to 116 people, with 80 injured. The latest clash is now the most deadly act of violence ever reported in the country's prison system. However, prison clashes have become a major problem for the country this year as similar clashes took place in February and July in various prisons throughout the country. According to local media, 234 people have been killed so far in the past eight months due to prison violence. This averages to about one prison death per day. Officials say the continued rise in prison riots and deaths is due to the overwhelmingly low number of prison guards in comparison to the number of inmates, as well as ongoing fights between gangs for control of the prisons. Meanwhile, Ecuador's President Guillermo Lasso says the state will assist the families of the dead and injured, adding that he would send additional security forces and free up funds to avoid another violent riot. And finally, over in the U.S., a woman who survived the 1918 Spanish flu as well as the Second World War succumbed to COVID-19 at the age of 105 last month. Despite being fully vaccinated, Primera Giocopini contracted the virus once again 
and was sent to the ICU before she passed away. The centenarian was just two years old when her mother died of the Spanish flu in 1918, as that pandemic killed more than 675,000 Americans, a death toll eclipsed last month by the COVID-19 pandemic. Lee seung Arirang News. Hello, I'm Lee ji with the latest weather updates. Saraksan Mountain is seeing the season's first autumn foliage, and by the end of month, we'll be enjoying beautiful autumn colors throughout Korea. It's another day with the wide gaps in the readings. In fact, Haman County in Gyeongsang Namdo province will see gaps of more than 15 degrees Celsius. Lots of sunshine is in the forecast with high UV rays across Korea during the day. The northern parts of the country, including here in the capital, could see heavy rain tonight. Afternoon highs will be a couple degrees higher in most parts. Taegu will be going up to 29 degrees Celsius. And you're going to enjoy the fine autumn weather conditions for the upcoming three-day holiday weekend. With that, here's a look at the weather conditions around the globe. And that will do it for us at this hour on Arirang News. I will be back in a few moments for our live coverage of the 73rd Armed Forces Day ceremony, so please stay tuned. Thank you for watching, and this was Kim Mo-kyun.